break. Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Now, now, and that's and and so it's really important for folks to realize that first of all, they're not actually by making these gifts going to be owing a tax, and the receipt the recipient's not going to be owing a tax, but they may be reducing the 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 amount when they die, the amount of, of the size of their estate that they can that they'll be able to transfer without having to file an estate tax return and without having to pay an estate tax. That's right. So they need to be aware of all those. They things. need to be aware of that. The other thing that I, that I want to make people aware of is what's called basis. Basis is the number from which you calculate gain. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you, your client purchased Raytheon. The famous stock. words, capital gain. Capital we're gain. We're talking about capital We're gain. talking about capital gain here, and we're talking, let's talk about your Raytheon stock. Yep. Client purchases it for $5. It's now worth $300. There's a $295 capital gain built into that. Because capital gain is the difference between, if I were to sell that stock, capital gain would be the difference between my sale price, which in that case would be $300, and $5. What you paid for it, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and there'd be a tax on that $295. That's right. And, and about what is the capital gain tax? Now? It can range, for, at the federal level, you, between 15 and 20%. Mm -hmm. Plus, depending on what your, your overall income is, it could be an yep. additional 3.8% on top of that. That's uh, at the federal level. And then at the state level, there's an additional 5.25%. So this is pretty hefty now. You're, you're getting up to 28 29% for, 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 for your tax. capital gains. That's right. So let's just say a parent were to gift that Raytheon stock to their child. Right. The child takes the, generally, as a general rule, for appreciated property, the child's going to take the parent's basis, the $5. So when the child sells it, they're going to recognize that two hundred ninety-five dollar capital gain and pay a tax on it. And that's going to be in the neighborhood. It could be of about twenty-five percent. Um, it could be. Again, yeah. there are a lot of factors that come into yeah. play, but let's just let's use the twenty-five percent number. Right now, when an individual passes away owning an asset, mm -hmm. there's what's called a step up in basis, or in sometimes a step down. But the basis becomes the fair market value at the time of death. So let's That's say your right. client kept that stock and said, you know, I really want to go to my child, but I realize if I give it to him, I'm, I'm, I'm giving him this tax right. liability too. Yeah. And maybe I don't have a taxable estate anyway. So better answer might be from a tax perspective to have the parent retain that stock. They pass away with owning that stock. Yeah. So now the basis goes from $5 to $300. The child receives it as a beneficiary of the estate and sells it. Well, their basis is three hundred, and they sell it for three hundred, so they have no capital gain. So they've saved could could be twenty five percent of three hundred dollars, or like seventy five dollars, just on that one share of stock. That's right. right? That's right. And, and 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 as opposed to if, if they if they had if the parent had simply given them those shares, they'd be paying this big big stock number. Yes. So what you what you're telling me is that when people are tempted to give away shares of stock and and any other asset of significance that's got a ca that was in the capital gain system, the house, the house, the house. Now there's a big a big number. There's a big number and a big minefield because as you know there are a lot of issues that go along with the house and what to do with the family house. A lot of parents purchased their houses 30, 40 years ago, maybe more and have a very low basis. And for you know, they'll, they'll read an article that says, I should gift it to my child. So they'll gift it to their child, and, they'll, and the child will take the parent's basis. And then if they turn around to sell and that property. And they turn around and sell that property, now they've got this capital gain that they had never anticipated. Yes. Versus yes. if the parent were either, if the parent were to sell it, the parent may, could exclude two hundred fifty or maybe $500,000 of the gain. If it's their home. If it's their home. It's a principal residence. Or alternatively, they pass away owning that home, and we get our step up in basis to the full fair market value. So let's just say the parents purchased the house in the 60s for $40,000, and it's now worth $400,000. We've got a $360,000 embedded gain. That's an astonishing amount. Well, it is when you have to write a check for 25% of that number. But by the way, I was just having this conversation with a wonderful, the classic little old lady. Uh, in Nantucket, 
right, who had purchased their home. They had purchased their home for in the 90s. Uh, actually, they bought the land and built the house. Total cost $60,000. Uh, current uh, uh, assessed value at the, at the assessor's office this is a small house, on a very nice house on a little lot close to downtown Nantucket, $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. But she said she was sure that she could get more than that because there's a property across the street that just went on the sale on, on, the, on the market for $5 million. And, and her question was, wouldn't I be saving some estate tax money by giving this property to my children right now, mm -hmm. right? And my answer was, first, yeah, yeah, you might, but there's another impact to this because once again, in this case, we know I knew that the children were never going to be living in that house, right? They, right. right? So they were never going to be able to get any kind of exemption. Mm -hmm. So I said, the first thing that you want to do is you don't want to do that, right? I said, the second thing that you want to do is talk to Alan Falk. I actually said that. So that that the, so those are the, the moral of this story is. For me listening to, you got to do the math on this stuff. That's exactly right. You don't want to take the advice of your neighbor or something that you just read in the papers and just do it. It's really a question about doing the math. It, and that's what it comes down to. It comes down to the math. You want to compare, if I don't transfer this house and it's in my estate, yeah. what am I going to pay for an estate tax? If I do transfer it and I, I shift this embedded gain to my children, what is the tax liability going to be? And now where we have our, our state our federal state tax exemption up to five point three four million and, and going yeah. higher every it has been going higher every, every year, year because of inflation, yeah. a lot there are very few estates that are subject to a state tax. So you now in Massachusetts we still have our one million dollars. So we have to we have to balance our depending on what the, the other assets the client has, we have to balance what would be a Massachusetts estate tax with the value of the step up in basis. Right. So it really is, uh, I don't want to say a number crunching exercise, but that's what it is, at least from a tax perspective. And I think people typically have this knee-jerk reaction to gift. And I think with our increasing estate tax exemption, you really need to sit down and think, does it make sense to gift? Or should I retain it and have it pass through my estate? So when you're talking to your kids um, this Christmas or this Hanukkah or this holiday about the fact that you were just about to give them a whole bunch of stuff and you decided against it because you saw something on TV, you know, and they get mad. Just tell them, well, you know, we should be sitting down with our lawyer or our accountant and talking about this. So the moral of the story is before you do gifting, um, whether it is to charity or whether it is to one of your relatives, you need to do the math. Or else, and, and if you're trying to do that math, trust me, you're never going to get this. You need to talk to a professional. You need to talk to someone who is a tax professional, whether that's an accountant uh, or an attorney, and make sure you get this right. These are big, big numbers we're talking about here, right? That's right. And and especially to the extent that your you know that your goal is to be doing something charitable um, for a charity or something to really help your children. In either case, you want to maximize what you're giving them and let Uncle Sam pay a part of the tab. And that's why you need a professional. Alan, thank you so much. I really, really, en I really enjoyed the presentation. I, you know, I, and I enjoyed kind of having you think out that you, this is, these are all the reasons why I don't do this stuff. <laughs> Whenever people call me and say, so how does this work? I say, well, you know, I got a guy that I can talk to about that. So thank you very much. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays, and we'll see you next year. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diana Przinski. I'm a certified health coach. I help people choose food that makes them feel fantastic.
Today I want to talk about breakfast. Breakfast being so important because it sets the tone for the day. The typical American breakfast starts out with a sugary, carb-laden breakfast. Things like cereals, bagels, donuts, muffins, and toast. Carbs equal sugar. We start our day with sugar, we're setting our foot out on the sugar roller coaster. We feel great right away and we crash. Have you ever found yourself at your desk at 10 a.m. starving, counting the minutes to lunch? Well, let's have a breakfast that really satisfies us, fills us up, and gives us great energy to get us through the morning. The two key components to a great breakfast are protein and fat. We've talked about healthy fats before, but let's have a quick reminder. What are some of the healthy fats that we can easily incorporate into our breakfast? Nut butters are probably the easiest. We can add these to our piece of toast, um, or uh, a smoothie even if we want. Great way to get some good healthy fats. Coconut oil and butter are other great fats. They're great to cook in, especially if we want to cook eggs, which are a great source of protein. Eggs are the tried and true, and we can have them in many ways. Have them hard boiled, make some egg salad, make a, uh, a quiche or an omelet. You can cook a quiche on a Sunday night, cut it in quarters, and you have breakfast on the go for four days of the week. But don't worry, you don't have to have breakfast food for breakfast. You can have leftover dinner. I know it sounds funny, but the breakfast police aren't going to come get you. Try having leftover dinner or lunch, some leftover meat and vegetables. Smell it, taste it, feels really good. See how you feel during the day. How long does it keep you full? Is it giving you more energy? Do your own little test. Try your, your usual breakfast and, and do an energy check at 10, 11, and 12 o'clock. Try that again after having a real good, nutritious, healthy breakfast with proteins and fats. See which makes, feel you, makes you feel the best. I guarantee when you add some protein and fat, you will feel fantastic.